Check, check, check. Is this on? Yes. Is it good? Okay. Um, it must be a good microphone because I, I can only hear my voice. Um, we are, if you would, please cut, please cut the lights. Um, I, I want to thank you guys for inviting me back this year. Uh, again, we did Cement City last year. And just a quick word about Cement City. Uh, Cement City is this year going to be included in the Miniature Railroad at Carnegie Science Center. We've got six, oh, I don't think we need that many. Um, there you go, okay, that's, that's good, thank you. Um, uh, Cement City is going to be included, six houses from Cement City are going to be included in the new display at the Miniature Railroad. So try to go down and take a look at that and, uh, if, if you would, uh, if, if, if you are able. Tonight we're going to talk about the Lenora smog disaster. This is the worst, uh, this is the worst, the deadliest air pollution uh, incident in the United States, in the history of the United States. And we do a lot of work with uh, school-aged children. So I was glad to see that there are some students here tonight. Uh, you might get an idea for a project. We have an incredible resource base. People come literally from all over the world uh, to see our resources. Uh, we call ourselves the Smog Museum, but we're really the Denora Historical Society, much like you guys are the Bridgeville Historical Society. But you need that, Bridgeville, you guys, you need that hook. You need the hook, the, the bait to throw out there into the water and get them to come into your place. And this is what we use, the, the uh, Denora Smog Museum and Historical Society. And we associate ourselves with people, the upper echelon of people, in the history business. Uh, we work with uh, the Heinz History Center, we're an affiliate partner. Uh, we also work with Cal U and the dig Digital Storytelling Program, and we work with the Library of Congress Teaching with Primary Sources Program as well. And that's all due to the Denora Historical Society being the oldest community historical society in Washington County. Uh, they started in 1946, and which is two years before the disaster. So when the disaster was taking place, there was a historical society already in place to start recording it. Now, a lot of these guys were, the people that started this historical society were just amateur historians, not professional historians like me. I've, I've made tens of dollars uh, being a professional historian, and I, I hope you caught that, tens of dollars. Yes, if, if you're going to be a professional historian, you need to be something else. And I am a high school teacher, I teach, I also teach uh, introductory classes at uh, Cal U. Uh, as an adjunct, which is, of course, because they don't want to pay uh, a, uh, a tenured professor to actually teach those hundred level courses. Uh, but these are some of the tools that we have available at the museum. People come literally from around the world to see, to, to use them. Dr. Deborah Davis, Dr. Deborah Davis was on the team that um, won the Nobel Prize a few years ago with Al Gore. Al, Al Gore was the head of that. He, of course, he has a whole team of scientists uh, and Deborah Davis was one of them. Ironically, Deborah Davis, or coincidentally, De Deborah Davis is from Denora. Uh, and people come literally from all over the world again uh, to do documentaries. This is Pioneer Productions from London, England. They were at the museum. So some of my students get to meet them. This is Carmen Sawa. Uh, she graduated a few years ago with Pennsylvania History Day winner in 2013, and then went on to finish ninth nationally with a video that she made. Uh, Gabe Schroeder finished second nationally in, on, in, in, in the History Day competition. Uh, and uh, just all sorts of students, again, that we uh, This is the longest distance student that I ever helped. Uh, about 10 years ago, we put together a website when she was at the Concordia International School in Shanghai, China. That she came to the United States a few years later and was looking at uh, colleges to go to and found her way to Denora. And believe me, it's not easy to find your way to Denora now because every bypass road does just that. Every, every bypass road that's built now bypasses Denora. Uh, so it is, it's, it's, it's kind of a land of the lost place to go. Uh, authors from all over the world, again, uh, documentarians. This, I want to point out, Rumor of Blue Sky. If you're really interested in getting in-depth into the, if we put this video out in, in uh, 2009. Uh, it took us about five years to make, and it is interviews of people who remember the smog. And in that, sh in that nine year period, about three quarters of the pe those people have passed. And so it's a valuable, valuable resource, primary resource of oral histories of, of the disaster. 
uh, the polluters. Uh, uh, people are always asking us to recommend books. If you want to look at the political response to the smog disaster, read the polluters. Now, After the Fog is just a fun book. It's, it's what's called historic fiction. Kathy Shoup, who is from Oakmont, puts her character in the 1948 smog disaster. It's a visiting nurse named Rose, and then she is very meticulous about how she advances that story. Uh, historic, incredibly historically accurate, uh, and, and a really fun read. Uh, okay, now we're going to do something that my kids hate at school, and I don't know, uh, who's, the, who's the teacher here? Okay. Do your kids hate it when you have, when it, I, when I come into class and I say, "Okay, get out your notebooks. We're going to lay a foundation." It's the foundation of before I'm going to give you all this information before I can even begin to tell you the story. So it's going to be about an hour before we actually get to the story. And it's a deadpan face. Okay, one head shake. We're good. I'm glad because it's not going to be an hour before we get to the story. The starts in 1901 and. What Denora is, is a boom town. Prior to, to 1901, Denora is really just farmland. And then this guy comes along, William H. Donner. He's from Indiana, and he helps start the town of Manesson. Everybody's heard of the town of Manesson, right? Well, that starts in 1898. In 1901, he starts also the town of Denora. Uh, but he wants to name it, actually, he wants to name it Mellonville, because part, one of, some of his business partners are Henry Clay Frick, uh, Richard B. Mellon, Andrew Mellon, a lot, Philander Knox, these are all people who lived in that east end of Pittsburgh. I was talking to somebody about the big houses. Yeah, Ryan, right? And we were talking, he was talking to me about the big houses in the east end of Pittsburgh. This is where all those guys lived. These were the steel magnets, uh, the industrial movers and shakers of, of, of the era. And this is one of his part this is one of Mr. Donner's partners, Mr. Mellon. Andrew Mellon will go on to become Secretary of the Treasury on the Coolidge administration. Now at this time, of course, he's one of the leading bankers in the world, and he just gets married in 1900 to this young lady from Ireland named Nora McMullen. Uh, she's 20, he's 44. So as you can see, it's a marriage, it's a match made in heaven, right? Uh, no, it's, in 1913, there's going to be a scandalous divorce. If you really want to read something, you think today's papers are bad, and the things that they print and you see on TV, nothing compared to the Mellon divorce. Um, I, I can't repeat some of the things in mixed company that actually make it into the paper. But anyway, uh, so they, Mr. Mellon doesn't want his, town, his name associated with the town, so he comes up with the idea of naming it for Mr. Donner and Nora his new, his, his, his blushing bride, who when she arrives in Pittsburgh uh, after getting married in her castle, she's, she's not just some poor young lady, she lives in a castle in Ireland. Her father, among other things, owns the Guinness Brewery, uh, shipping industry, all sorts of things. It's her father and Andrew who think it's, it's a good idea that Nora, Nora should marry Anne. But their company is indeed the Union Improvement Company. And this is the norm, very, very early on, probably around 1900 or so, and they're selling lots. They're, these are land lots. And they're starting this community. Now, this photograph is taken, uh, it's not a glass plate, it's a government photograph. It's an aerial taken from 1941. And remember, we talked about Cement City last time. There's Cement City. This is, of course, the Monongahela River. And this is the industrial complex. There's downtown Denora. The industrial complex is a blast furnace. It's two blast furnaces, Bessemer converters, 13 open hearths, uh, a wire works, a rod mill, a nail mill, a blooming mill, uh, a fence binding mill, and then the zinc works and an acid plant. This is Carnegie's vertical integration in action. The idea of everything that you need for the production of your product is in-house. And what, but what they're using here at the zinc works is something called the Belgian method of smelting zinc, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But as you can see, even from the great distance that I see you out there, far, far away, you can see all of the erosion that's taking place around the zinc works. You can see here that there, is, there are trees and some things growing across from the blast furnace and the open heart, but if you look across from the zinc works, there isn't anything growing on the, on the western side, there isn't anything growing on the eastern side. So, and that's going to play into the disaster itself. But these are from glass plate negatives of the mill. There's the open heart, uh, the workers, the laborers that come to Denora. Denora is a town that attracted a wide variety of immigrants. And this is one of my favorite pictures 
taken by Mr. Bruce Driesbach, who was uh, the official photographer uh, at the mill. And you can just see different ethnicities in the way they wear their beards or the way they shave, uh, the way they dress. Uh, this is the Denora Southern Railroad, and those are called slag pots. And they're, they're going to figure into what they're going to start doing. This is, this is a typical slag pot. Uh, they're going to start doing very early in Denora, and that's the first thing they're going to start doing very early in Denora is pollute. That's the, that's the primary thing that they're going to, they're, they're going to try, they're, they're, they're going to accomplish. And as you can see, what they're going to do is build this 25 foot high seawall so that the mill doesn't get flooded. Now, actually, the bank, is, as you can see, that there is a few years later when the tank course is being built, but actually the bank is relatively shallow there in, in Denora. Uh, Monongahela is reputedly a, a, an Iroquois Indian word that means high-falling banks, and, but actually the banks are relatively shallow on, on, on the floodplain side of the river. Uh, and, and most of the mills will get flooded eventually, but not too much. You can see this is before they build up the riverbank. It is relatively shallow, probably about maybe 13, 14 feet high. Uh, from a famous photograph that uh, we are in an argument with the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress claims that they own this photograph. Uh, and in reality, we have the original glass plate negative. We own the original glass plate negative. So how do you figure we're going to fare with the Library of Congress? Do you think we're going to beat the Library of Congress? <laughs> no, I don't think we're going to beat them. But, uh, but, but we, we are in the right. And of course, that, that, that's the anacronym for war, right? We are right, W-A-R, we are right. Uh, so this is where uh, they're going to build the zinc works. And they're going to build the zinc works right across the street from where the most prominent bosses in the North actually are living. And this is, this is um, the superintendent's house, and it's right across the street from the zinc works. Now, I'm going to show you a compare and contrast picture here. This is the opening of, this, uh, of the superintendent's house in 1904. And then just a few years later, this is what it looks like. This is the superintendent's house and when they build the zinc works right across. What's happening, of course, is the pollution. And that's the sulfur trioxides and the... Um, uh, the sulfur trioxide and the fluoride and fluorine gases that are coming out of the zinc works is killing all of the vegetation. All of the vegetation in Denora and of course across the river in the, little, in the little village of Webster. But prior to this, they are doing things like playing baseball down there on the field. As you can see in the background there, you can see the open heart stacks. Way over there, the open heart stacks. Uh, but, and this is where the zinc works is eventually going to be built. Uh, there's a housing in Denora, but there's a housing shortage in Denora. So people are living in all sorts of conditions. And this is eventually going to get plowed under to build the zinc works. Uh, conditions are brutal. And these are great glass plate negative photographs. Would you agree, Ryan? I mean, these are just, these are really, really good, great glass. And we have dozens and dozens of these. And I like, I do like to trot them out and show them off. And I'm going to show you the progression here now in Webster. Webster is a little village right across the Webster, Denora, Denora Webster Bridge. And you can see the Denora Webster Bridge there as, 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 as well. And on the, on the hills, they have sheep farming and orchards. And they have, a, they have a flour mill down along the river. And it's a really nice little village until they start building this thing next to it. Uh, right across the river. As the industrialization continues and moves on, they plow all of that housing under, and then they are going to start building the zinc works. And when the zinc works starts to go up, all of these bosses are going to move out. Because as soon as they know that that Belgian process is going to take place of creating of smelting zinc right across from their house, they're going to move out because it's going to kill all of the, of course, the vegetation that we talked about. Now, this is not PennDOT. Now, my, I, I pick on PennDOT because my son-in-law is an engineer for PennDOT. So uh, I'm going to be, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm now permitted to pick on PennDOT. This is not a PennDOT project. Uh, they put this up and are producing zinc. They, 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 they start breaking ground in January, and they're producing zinc by September. So it's not a bridge on Route 70 that is under construction for 16 days. Is there, is there a PennDOT engineer in here? No? Okay. So I, I apologize if, if, if you have, you have family or 
Now, we use postcards to tell us a story or to tell us a lie. And these are postcards that are lying to us because this is what the postcard is saying that the zinc works in Denora looks like. In reality, this is what the zinc works in, in Denora looks like. There really is literally no color down there. You can take a color photograph down there, but it's going to show up all of the grays and the dirt and all that sort of thing. I, I've interviewed a lot of zinc workers uh, over the years, and one of the things that they told me is that if you, you either walk through mud or dust, it was six, six inches of dust or six inches of mud walking to work because there wasn't anything growing to absorb moisture. Now this is the Belgian process, horizontal retort process, that's perfected by the Spanish in the northwest uh, zinc fields in Spain. And it is exported to the United States, and that's why we have a huge Spanish population in Denor uh, for many, many years. Uh, Mr. McCants can probably attest to that, uh, can, can tell you about that. that, we, that this, this, the superintendent's house eventually becomes the Spanish club. Uh, but we're not really interested in this from an engineering standpoint. We're just kind of interested in this from, from what, what, the, what the pollution value of this is. And as you can see, the conditions that these guys work in are brutal. A zinc worker works three hours a day but is paid for eight because he cannot stand that environment for eight continuous hours. So what, he, what you see here is a typical zinc worker. He's protected from basically the waist down, but he's not protecting his face. Because when you tap a retort, uh, if you've ever heard the phrase, I'm all tapped out, this is, what, this is basically where the phrase comes from. Whenever you're talking about a, 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 a worker who is tapping retorts, when you, once you, all of your retorts are tapped, you're, you're tapped out. So when they tap the retort, they're going to put uh, a, it's a small hammer and they break the bottom of the spelter furnace. These are all, and these are the retorts. The whole thing is called a spelter furnace. And he is going to, 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 to break that open that around 80, 1,800 degrees. And if he does it on top, it's going to splash up in his face. But if he does it from below, it's going to just splash down onto his shoes. Now, these are hot retorts. Uh, these, these are posed pictures because when you're at the face of the spelter furnace, there are dozens and dozens of guys working all at the same time. And it's a very chaotic environment uh, as, as well, I, I, I've been told. So um, these are all posed photographs. So that worker is going to tap that retort and he's going to put it into a ladle. And he's going to take that ladle and then he's going to pour it into a mold. And then he's going to get eventually, as it hardens, it's going to come out a zinc bar. And you guys know what you use zinc for? Anybody come up with an idea? For, I thought I heard it. Galvanizing. Galvanizing, sure. You're, you're galvanizing. Again, this is part of Carnegie's vertical integration. Uh, they are galvanizing nails and wire and rods um, and fabric fence and things like that. So they're not going to send it out to somebody else to galvanize. You need to make the product to galvanize, and a lot of this is going to get shipped as well, because this is at the time, um, not the time of the disaster, but between 1916 and 1936, this is the largest zinc works in the world, it is in Denora, Pennsylvania. Now, American Steel and Wire, who uh, owns it in the beginning and then eventually becomes a subsidiary of United States Steel, always claims that the, the zinc works was harmless, that, that the the acid and zinc fumes were not dangerous. But in 1921, uh, I found this in the Norworks News. Now, do you get the impression that this is something that's harmless? Uh, in fact, right now, we, right now what we have going on is a remediation suit in Denor. There are a group of people that have gotten together. There was a suit in um, Spelter, West Virginia. Did you guys ever hear about that suit? Uh, where DuPont had a zinc works and they went in and um, uh, and they had to remediate that zinc works, and there was an 11 million or something remediation done in Spelter, West Virginia. Well, the same thing is probably going to happen eventually in Denor. Uh, United States Steel wanted to get it thrown out of court. Uh, just recently, the judge said that it could go on to trial, and so they're moving forward. Uh, we found, not necessarily a smoking gun, but some, again, glass plate negatives of well, we're not really sure what, they, what, what, what they're studying here, but they are doing soil tests, plant-like soil tests, in the mill at the time 
Uh, and uh, United States Steel lawyers have looked at this and said that we should not have we should not have this information. This is sensitive information, and that we shouldn't share it with anyone. Uh, we did indeed share it with everyone. So, um, uh, so we are, uh, I guess, bad guys in the United States Steel um, eyes. But anyway. Uh, this particular information is telling us what, it, what, what the effect is on the toxins that are coming out of the zinc works on plant life. But we know that there is an effect on workers, and they get something called the zinc shakes or the zinc jitters. And that's if you stay in that environment too long. If you, you are there, you remember that photograph I just showed you of the guy opening up the vent above the spelters? Well, he, did, he wasn't wearing any type of respiratory aid, right? So if he breathes that for too long, he's going to get this. And these are the typical symptoms of everyone in, in the 1948 smog disaster. You're lightheaded, you're dizzy, you're short of breath. What's happening is that the fluoride gases and the uh, sulfur trioxides are beginning to affect lung tissue. The same way that it affects the breathing tissue of plant life, begins to affect the breathing tissue of human beings and animals, and in that concentrated way, uh, that that the um, that that the um, that, that the temperature inversion, and we didn't even mention the temperature inversion. But we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, as as the temperature inversion increases, then the concentration of toxins increases as well. But they came up with a remedy for the zinc shakes, and it's partially good and partially just. Uh, uh, kind of like a, a home remedy. Uh, water, milk, ice, oatmeal, and of course whiskey. You need the whiskey to get them to actually drink it. But uh, oatmeal and milk are actually absorbing toxins, and water and ice are hydrating you and cooling you down. And then, and then the final thing that, they, that the zinc workers told me was, they re, 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 the, the, the doctors told them, drink it outside in the fresh air. Well, welcome to outside in the fresh air. This is outside the zinc works, and this is what the fresh air looked like. This is actually a good day uh, in the north. Uh, we get a lot of requests. People say, do you have any pictures of the smog disaster? And I say, OK, think about that for a second. These people cannot see their hand in front of their face. Do you think they're going to run and get a camera to take a picture of that? So, but again, these are all from August Siren, who was a photographer in Denora um, at, at the time. Again, primary resources. And primary resources can take place, anyone can take a primary resource. This is basically a Polaroid taken in the late 1940s from Webster looking back into Denora. The zinc works would be over in this area here, but of course you can't really see uh, the, the zinc works. But just to let you know that uh, this is 3rd Street in the north. This is about, the Zinc Works is at 14th Street, and this is 3rd Street. So this is what Denora looked like. There was a lot of pollution in Denora at the time. But there was a lot of pride in Denora as well. And Mr. McCann's wore his Denora Home of Champions shirt. And we'll tell you who the champ, all the champions were a little bit later. We won't get into that right now. But there was an incredible amount of pride. And, and growing up in Denora was a lot of fun. Uh, according to people who grew up in Denora. I grew up in, in, in the far away city of Monongahela, all of five miles away from Denora. And this is a parade, but you live, the parade is taking place in the shadow of the zinc works. And uh, you went to concerts in Donner Park, in the shadow of the open park. And you can see the glass for himself into, into the background. Even in Cement City, you can see the zinc smoke rising behind Cement City. So Denora is surrounded by pollution. This is uh, a couple of young ladies up on Haslip Avenue. And this is um, Easter Sunday, 1939, was written on the back of this photograph. And you have a uh, Kastler School and the Zinc Works in the background. People got married in the shadow of the Zinc Works. Uh, kids played in the shadow of the Zinc Works. Uh, you, this is being hurrah, and that's a whole other story. I would need an hour to tell you about this character. But there's the zinc works, and, and he, he's, he's in his horse and sleigh. You went to the movies every Saturday. Uh, and, and there were sunny days in Denora. This is the heart of downtown Denora back in 1950, when it was still at the height of its power. And there was everything you needed was right downtown. My kids, we talked today uh, about how we shop and what, we, what, what I did when I was a kid 
and that's when they go to sleep when I tell them about my childhood. And then we go to uh, 1948 in downtown Lenora. Uh, traffic going in both directions, a trolley line going down the street. Uh, this photograph was taken by Alfred Eisenstadt. He came to Denora with Life magazine in 1948 after the disaster. Now this is the Zinc Works Mixer House, and this is uh, this is um, Gilmore Cemetery. Now, Gilmore Cemetery predates Denora. It's where people from Webster. Webster was a community started in 1833, and Denora, of course, in 1901. And this is where the people from Webster would bury their dead across the river in the north. Uh, but after the Zinc Works moved in uh, it, and killed all of the vegetation, most of the people here were disinterred and moved to other places. But I want you to look at this. This is not a winter scene. And this is not snow piled up here. This is pure, raw sulfur, which is a byproduct. Which Sulfur is a byproduct of smelting zinc. And it's laying right in the yard. And there's railroad tracks running here. But this road that's running right along here is a state route, State Route 837. And so you're just driving right past pure raw sulfur laying out in the yard. Now, this would never happen today. Again, because of the 1948 temperature inversion, uh, you, you have laws in place that don't allow that to happen. And this is Gilmore Cemetery. Remember the boss's houses? These are the boss's houses, long gone, and you can just barely make the stacks out, even though they're almost right across the street. Uh, some more great photographs uh, of just the desolation of what it looked like. This is Denora on a decent day when you could actually take some a photograph of, of the smog. Um, now Webster got a bit of a um, inferior, it has, it has a bit of an inferiority complex because they would try to take American Steel and Wire to court, but as you might imagine, American Steel and Wire uh, is not someone to take you, that you easily take to court. And, they, and, and it, it usually turned out very poorly for the folks at Webster. There really wasn't a decision until after that. This is taken from the Webster Bridge. This is what the people in Webster had to live with every single day. And if you look at the, uh, this photograph across the river on Webster Hill, uh, there's no vegetation. So all of that uh, topsoil has been washed away. You're down now to sandstone rock. Uh, and uh, you have these deep gullies that kids go up and they play in. Uh, and downtown Webster is, has just lost all of its personality. This is um, a backyard in Webster uh, prior to the zinc works, uh, excuse me, prior to uh, the zinc works being built. And then we have Webster, it looks like a moonscape almost, as, as you can see. This is the famous photograph that Collier's Magazine saw. And again, more glass plate negatives of Webster. All of those homes would have had grass and, and landscaping in front of them. And kids, the kids in Webster still played. They played football and did all of, all of the things that kids do. Uh, you know, you, you just keep moving forward. Uh, the Society for Better Living is, we've, the research that we've done is really telling us that the Society for Better Living is the first grassroots group that's taking a multinational corporation to court. And uh, this is Beanie Hurrah again, and again, Beanie is, is, is an incredible character. We can talk a lot about Beanie Hurrah um, as well. So we finally made it to the disaster. So what happens in that weekend uh, is something called a temperature or weather inversion. A layer of warm, or excuse me, cold air is trapping a layer of warm air near the surface. And that you don't have that uplift or draft that you need to get, get, the, the, um, get the effluent that's coming out of the mill to disperse evenly. And so uh, there's the stagnant atmosphere. Um, eventually, there are going to be 27 deaths over the course of the weekend. Uh, if you extrapolate it out, you've got about 56 more deaths coming in the next two weeks. Uh, but we identified 27 deaths over the course of the weekend. And the pathogen that we're looking at are fluoride and fluorine gases and sulfur trioxides. Uh, when I did something, I think it was for OSHA when, I was at, when we were at Pitt, uh, there was someone in, in the audience and he said, if you stick uh, your finger into sulfur trioxide, you will come back basically with nothing. It's something that will just evaporate. Uh, it, it will just will just totally, totally evaporate your, 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 your finger. 
So, um, what do you do? Suddenly you have a situation, it's 1948, and you don't have emergency medical technicians. What do you do? Your grandmother is on the floor, she can't breathe. Who do you call? Where do you go? Yeah, that's, that's the problem. They're not prepared. These people are not prepared for any type of a disaster like this. Now, temperature inversions happen all the time, and they probably happened before, but this is a particularly severe temperature inversion, and it lasts for six days. Um, it, what, we had a, a symposium with, we, that we did with some kids a few years ago, and we had uh, Stephen Cropper come in, and he had done some research, and the temperature inversion that settled over western Pennsylvania in the end of October 1948 was the most severe temperature inversion of the 20th century. It was the longest lasting temperature inversion. And, but the only place where people died was in Denora. And basically it was because of the zinc works. But nobody was going to admit that. Because, let's face it, Denora was Denora because of the mill. And you couldn't say anything bad about the mill. And the mill defended itself. We do not know our smoke and fumes are harmful from Mercer Neal. Uh, he's the gentleman on the left there. Uh, that's A.B. Worthington in the middle. He was the president of American Steel and Wire um, at, the, at the time. And the attitude of the people was similar. Uh, the attitude of the people was uh, uh, that this is something that we endure. This is the trade off that we've made. Uh, you're going to pay us well, and the zinc workers were paid well, uh, but um, we're, and we're going to we're, we're going to turn uh, a blind eye to all of the pollution and the damaging health effects that are going to take place. Harry Loftus, who I, who I interviewed, said basically the exact same thing. These guys had this macho attitude. Remember, a lot of these guys were Spanish, so that whole macho idea was ingrained in them uh, it, 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 almost ethnically. And then, and then a lot of the guys were just plain old tough guys. Guys who did storm the beaches of Normandy, which was an incredible achievement. Uh, and so do you think a little bit of smoke's going to bother them after they did that? Now, um, we have a lot of associations in, in the, at, at the museum. And one of them is digital storytelling. And um, about 10 years ago, a professor from Penn State named Manfred Koina found a poem written by this gentleman here, Gunther Kuhnert. Uh, Mr. Kuhnert uh, was a German Jew. He had just survived the Holocaust. And in 1948, or excuse me, 1950, he saw a 1948 article in Life magazine about the Denor smog disaster. And he wrote something called Song of a Small Town. As you might imagine, he wrote it in German. Manfred Koina is a professor of German studies at Penn State. He interpreted the poem for us into English and then sent it off to us at the Historical Society. A few years after that, a group of young ladies from digital storytelling at Cal U found the poem and made a digital story using our resources, our expertise, be that whatever that is, and um, created something called a digital story, and it's called A Town Called Denora. And you can find it on YouTube, uh, but we're going to go ahead and play it now. Now, everything that you see comes from the archives of the Denora Historical Society. I encouraged the young ladies to write an introduction to it. I felt that they, didn't, they couldn't just start with the poem. That's that foundation that my, that my students hate. Uh, so I, they, wrote, they wrote this introduction. And all I did was, was put some semicolons and, and commas in it. I mean, they did a brilliant job. Uh, they, they were the ones that, they, they're the ones that deserve all of the credit. We had the resources, but they're the ones that actually created this. The air was black and relentless. 21 fell victim to this hellish darkness the very darkness we created. The nations watched as we trembled, powerless. We changed the world, though we were too late to save our own. 
The year 1948. The place, Denora, Pennsylvania. Home of the killer industrial smog. Thousands of articles captured our demise as painters recreated horrific scenes we could not forget. The authors, artists, and poets of the world created works so authentic, I would swear they stood on the same streets, consumed by the same darkness. Our story, preserved in ink, in oil, in pen, poem, painting, pencil, pastel. But now, we're a tale of a time no one remembers, in a town soon to be forgotten. If ever we disappear, we'll find peace between verses of poems and stories, displayed and preserved in museums, ink and song. Our song, the song of a small town. There is a town called the Nora. A town in the midst of a valley in Pennsylvania with smoking mills, railroad yards, steel foundries and the big sink works. Inhabitants, 13,000. There is a town where grass is not green, where on surrounding hills farms are few, trying to live like their sheep, blackened by soot. And when it is time to sleep, when 13,000 turn out their lights, they can see, before they close their eyes, swirling smoke under the ceilings of their rooms, always. There is a town where they all sleep, where there is no one waking thought of the day that will be coming from October to November, 1948, called Friday in the town named Denora. And all will be sleeping while the fog descends and mixes with the steam of sink, smoke of the mills, the rail yards, the foundries, on the Friday that will be coming on time. And for none of the 19 who at noon on Friday suffocated already, will restlessness dye their dreams the color of blood, not a breath over their sleep or in that of 400 others on whose lungs this Friday will feast. A Friday like a rabbit plague stricken dog in a town where the grass is not green, which is named Denora. Inhabitants, only 13,000. Unknown. Now, I'll let the credits roll, because if you've ever had your intellectual property stolen, uh, like I have, uh, and I can't retain a lawyer, uh, you get very frustrated at that, so we're going to give these people credit. We heard the number 19 a lot. Uh, 19 was what was originally reported as the death toll, but later that was going to be changed to 27, and that's what Kuhner was actually working with uh, at, at, at the time. So everybody, everybody started to come to Denora after the disaster was, what was over. Um, this is a photograph that is misidentified by the Post-Gazette almost every year, or every time they do a story on the 1948 smog disaster, uh, they say that this is Denora at 12 noon on Saturday afternoon uh, of, of the disaster. This was actually taken um, on the evening of November 1st, after the disaster was already over. Uh, we talked to the fireman who took the, uh, the, it was the Pittsburgh Sun-Telegraph at the time, Oh, and they own the rights, and then the PG eventually took over the rights. And we have called them numerous times, and they, they said that they are going to go with, with, with what they're going to go with. Uh, and that is that they're going to say that this is 12 in the Norwin. When I know that I have talked to firemen like Bill Shemp and uh, Jim Glaris and John Volk, and said, no, that we, we took those reporters around, and it, it was on Monday night. Uh, they remember that very clearly. It was probably taken about 7 o'clock on Monday night. Uh, it is what Bill Shem told us. So, um, so don't believe everything you read in the paper. Uh, this is 7th Street, and this was taken, again, this is an Alfred Eisenstadt photograph, so uh, timeline owns, owns that. So 
again, just to give you an idea of what's going on in and around these think works, the Mill Hospital. Uh, there's no hospital in Denor, so what the people had to do at that time was you called the doctor and the doctor came to your house. You, I can still bear, I'm, I'm, I'm 61, and I can still kind of remember the, a time when the doctor would actually come to your house, sort of, uh, if, if, you were, if, if you were ill enough. And uh, this is what the people were doing, and the switchboard was jammed. In fact, my mother-in-law was 20 years old at the time, and she was working on the switchboard. She got to work on that particular Saturday morning, and the switchboard was in chaos because everybody was trying to get doctors. And she was a great interview in Rumor of Blue Sky because she, I mean, she was right there at that switchboard, and she tells some really great stories, uh, very, very, very powerful and emotional stories of people who are literally on the line uh, watching their loved one die. I mean, it's just incredible, incredible stuff that's going on. But the mill did have a hospital. Um, it's about one and a half times as big as my garden shed, and it's serving 8,000 people. Uh, and they did staff it with a doctor, a doctor and a nurse. But the, the most outspoken doctor in Denora was William Rogas. He was the one who said, it's the zinc works that's doing this. It's not anything else, it's the zinc works and you've got to shut the zinc works down. The biggest problem, of course, is that it's not like this room starts to get too hot and you go and you turn down the thermostat. Uh, that's not how you shut down a furnace uh, in, 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 in any mill. It takes days to bank those furnaces. Um, so a lot of great quotes come out of this. Again, primary resources. Uh, Dr. Rongus was very blunt. He would tell people, just get out of town. Don't even begin to stay here. Uh, as many people, yeah, he felt that the entire town should have been evacuated uh, over, the course of that, uh, over the course of that weekend. Uh, 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 Dr. Clarence Mills, he said that, um, this is just, this is another one of his quotes, but uh, Mills came to the conclusion that had, this, had the inversion lasted another day or two, we would be looking at death tolls in the hundreds, if not maybe even a thousand. Um, and so a lot of primary sources at the museum, we have death certificates. Uh, most of them uh, are of victims of the disaster, and in order to be a victim of the disaster, you had to have some type of a respiratory cause for your, for, for your death. And there are, are two, two of the guys who did a lot of the work. Now, Russ um, Martin, uh, hey, Russ Davis, I always get him mixed up. Remember Russ Martin, the catcher for the, for, for the Pirates? Um, I always get Mr. Davis mixed up with Russ Mark for some reason. But there's Jim and there's, there's Bill. Now these guys, they had just started to use oxygen as a way to bring back um, people who were under the influence of some type of smoke inhalation. And they had a few oxygen tanks at the fire department. And other fire departments started to send oxygen in um, as, as well uh, over the course of that weekend. I think this is a post-exact um, photograph. Um, as, as well, so they're sending oxygen tanks in over the course of the weekend. And they took these smaller oxygen, they, they would take the big tanks and fill up their smaller tank, uh, sort of like, uh, remember Mike Nelson, uh, Lloyd Bridges and Sea Hunt, he would have those tanks on his back, but that's what these guys did. They strapped those oxygen tanks to their backs, and uh, guys like John Volk and Russ Davis, Russ Davis was trying to drive the truck. John Volk was trying to coordinate with people calling in. Go to um, you know 835 Thompson Avenue. Somebody needs some oxygen. Well, they go to they find their way finally to 835 because it's really hard to see. And they get the person breathing normally again, and then they want to leave. And then the people, of course, are begging them to stay because they know that it's a matter of time before. That, that poison air is still out there and they're, they're going to need that oxygen again. So it's a very heart-wrenching thing um, that uh, Bill and uh, Jim talk about whenever we're in, 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 in room or blue sky. Um, and so there's no hospital in the north. So what do you do with all of these six, sick people? With the corner of 7th Street, there's a place that used to be called the Denora Hotel and they call, it, would, it had become a community center in 1946. And that's where the historical society was at that time, and, and the library as well. And they turned that into a triage center and emergency ward in the, in the basement. 
the funeral homes, the funeral directors ran out of caskets over that course of, of that weekend. Uh, because in, normally, this is at Shaw Reminescent Hospital, which is about four or five miles away from the north. Normally, 2.3 people a week should die in the north. And suddenly, over the course of two days, you have 27. That's an incredible, incredible increase. Now, this, these are all Alfred Eisenstadt photographs from Life Magazine. As I said, Mr. Eisenstadt came with the writer uh, from Life Magazine. And this is, this is the only thing that Gunter Kuhnert saw when he created his poem. He saw this picture. I think it's coming up next. But I got out of sequence somehow. Uh, anyway, uh, so, so one of the things that we, that we interviewed pharmacists, uh, Rosemary Imes was a, a brand new pharmacist at the time in 1948. She and another young lady were the first two women to graduate from the Duquesne School of Pharmacy uh, a few years earlier. And she was a pharmacist in town and they were trying to prescribe things. There was a lot of coughing. Uh, there was a, because what's happening with the fluoride and fluorine gases is that it is attacking lung tissue. And in order to combat that attack on the lung tissue, the body begins to create fluid. And then naturally you're going to be coughing and hacking and all of that sort of thing. Now, I am a historian, okay, first and foremost. I am not an engineer, I am not a doctor, I am not, there, there's a whole list of things I am not, but I am a historian. So I am going to tell you it from a, the standpoint of what I have learned as a historian. So if you want to argue certain points about medical procedures or things like that, I'm going to tell you what the experts have told me, and then you know, write your emails to them and not to me. Um, I want to get to... Oh, that's an interesting one. Uh, it, in 1952, of course, we have the London disaster. Did anyone see The Crown? If you watched The Crown on TV, they did mention Denor. But in, in response to the London disaster, uh, this is what uh, Paris fashion houses started to come up with, the idea of a hat with some type of a mask on it. Uh, as you can see, th these are the young ladies from Denor. This is their sense of style, a, hand a handkerchief, that sort of thing. And then the, the, the upper echelon of, 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 of London society would, would have wanted something like that. So over the course of that weekend, there is the Halloween parade. Uh, it does take place. Uh, we have a, I, I interviewed one lady who was, at the time, she was eight years old. And she was in the parade. She remembers the parade. This is actually not a photograph of the Halloween parade because it, it probably couldn't have taken a photograph of the Halloween parade. This is just one of many parades in, in, in the North. And she was dressed, this young lady was dressed, the seven, eight-year-old, as an angel, and she had a white sheet. And it was the white sheet from her bed. And her mother gave her specific instructions, do not get this sheet dirty, because this is going back on your bed when you come home from the parade tonight. Well, she, was said, she said she was incredibly careful. And she walked in the parade, and she made sure that nothing touched the ground, or she didn't touch anything else. And she made it home, and she got in the house, and she looked under the light, and the sheet had turned yellow because of all of the sulfur in the air. And her mother gave her a whipping. And she said that she still remembers that. Well, I wish I could have been there, somebody could have been there to defend this young lady because um, that was just natural. Everything got turned yellow because of all of the excess sulfur um, in the air. There was a football game. People still argue about the football game. Could you see the football game? Couldn't you see the football game? There's a great story about Jimmy Russell running up and down the sideline, telling his players where the ball was uh, when it, when, when, whenever, whenever it was in the air on a punt or a kick or a pass or something. And of course, that begs the question is, why can a 45-year-old man see the football and a 16-year-old boy can't? So. Again, a lot of myths come out of the small, a lot of stories. Uh, and I, I, I put, and this of course is the, 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 uh, the, the Denora Hotel very early on uh, that was used as a temporary board. Uh, this is in 1951, actually, a couple years after the small, just to give you an idea that the building really didn't change very much. There were a lot of heroes in the small. Most of those people we don't even know, uh, but the doctors, with Shep, Laris, Wolf, Davis, all of the members of the Fire Department, the Denora Police Department, the outside agencies that tried to come in 
um, and, and help. Uh, the Bell Telephone Switchboard, that was the only means of communication. Those of you who are looking at your phone right now, and I, I always just say that because I know there's kids sneaking looks at their phone whenever I'm, I'm standing in front of lecturing, which is, I try not to lecture too much because le lecturing doesn't go over really well big these days, but they, they've, got, they've got to take it every once in a while. Um, so that was the only basic means of communication. And of course, these are party lines, and you have to connect each party into some type of a slot, and it takes a lot of time. So the papers start coming up. 19 people die. That's the original count. Uh, and then it's, you're going to see numbers in the 20s, 21, 27. Lawson's funeral home was a place where most of the people got buried from. And of course, Lawson's ran out of caskets. This is the Albert Eisenstadt photograph that we were talking about uh, in Life Magazine before. Uh, this is Peter Starkovich's funeral at uh, St. Dominic's <coughs> Cemetery. And you can see the zinc works uh, in, in the background. But the zinc works never actually shut down. The company said they shut it down. But the best they could do was to begin to bank the furnace because they began pouring the following Monday. And then papers are coming. And investigators are going to be coming in. And all sorts of stories are going to begin to be written about the smog. And the Denora Historical Society is going to be in place to catch them. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of amateur historians who did a really great job. Um, of course, there has to be propaganda as well. Uh, the message to the employees from the company was this. Uh, yes, it was a disaster. Yes, it was awful. But please, if you read this whole thing, Please recognize that we, the company, United States Steel, have, bears no responsibility in any of the deaths. Of course, that is an outright lie. Um, because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a twofold responsibility. It's the weather, which of course we can't control, and it's the toxins that are coming out of the, uh, out of the mill, which we can control. Uh, and of course, this is what the company is going to argue, that the death smog is an act of God. And that's going to scare the lawyers of, uh, American, uh, of the Society for Better Living into settling out of court. What starts out as a $7.4 million lawsuit, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in 1951 numbers and money, that's a lot of money. Um, whenever there's a disaster, there's always somebody willing to take, begin to try to take advantage of it. And the, the the beach resort community of New Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, took advantage of the smog disaster. They gave 25 vacations to people from Denora who would come down to New Wilmington to actually um, recover, and I put that in quotations, from the smog. Uh, what they did basically was parade them around town and take pictures at the different resort areas. So they were being basically used by that particular beach community. Um, and we heard the same stories after 9-11. I mean, it's just amazing uh, how, the, the, how, how low people can sink to make a few dollars. Um, so the federal government wants to come in and study. But there's a problem. People aren't going to say anything bad about the mill. Many fail to cooperate. The mill has to actually send out a letter to say it's OK to talk. The people are very, very cautious about what they're going to say. And when they do finally talk, um, they don't say a whole lot. Um, so the health survey showed, eventually it's going to show that 4,400 people were made sick by the smog. And this, this is where I wanted to get to with, with, with Cooner. This is all that Gunter Cooner saw when he wrote that poem. A, a small paragraph in Life magazine with a few photographs. And he came up with that great poem. I think I, I should have just deleted that the picture. There's Dr. Rongus. There's the guys from, the, from 12th Street. Uh, and, and that's it. That's all Gunter saw. So a year later, Webster is having a memorial. And they invite officials from the United States Steel. And they invite people from Denora to come over to, to participate in this memorial. Well, unfortunately, nobody from either camp shows up. And that's what helps fuel this competitive fire. Now, Mr. McCann's talked to me before about something that is his dad would never talk about it. That generation didn't talk about it. It's only in the last 10 years, people of my generation 
I have begun to ask questions, and students, the students who left, who I'm sure had to get to bed because they've got to get up for school, and so do I, because I go to bed at 9.30, so you know I'm going to be finished before 9.30. Um, uh, people of, that, of, of our generation begin to ask questions and say, how do we get the clean air laws? How, how does all of this start? Uh, and so we begin to study it as, as historians. And that's, that's pretty much what history is. It has to be removed from the generation it happens to. You have to move forward, and there has to be somebody else. Like, what the, the political climate of today is not going to be studied by me and written about by me and my generation. It's going to be written about by these kids who just walked out of here. It's not going to be us. We're going to try to put our hand in it, but we're, we're, we're not going to be successful because they're going to, they're going to be the ones that, to, to, to decide what that horrible job we're doing right now. Um, anyway, that's the end of my political assessment. Um, so there's the Webster uh, uh, Memorial. Uh, we put this up in 2009. This is the best that we could come up with, the list, the most comprehensive list that we could come up with, with victims of the smog museum, uh, the, of the smog. And we find different things. Eventually, uh, we, we do find people. Tom Short was a victim of the smog. And in our collection, we eventually run across a photograph of him on his wedding day. Um, we got, uh, in uh, 1994, 1995, uh, Justin Shawley, who was at the time the son of the president, who was the president, he, she, he still is the son, but she's not the president anymore, uh, Pat Shawley of the General Historical Society, and he did this as a school project uh, because, uh, again, people of our generation really didn't look at it as something important. So we can look at all sorts of myths about the smog, and we're not, I don't think we're going to do that. Uh, to today, so we're going to move on. Uh, one of the myths, of course, that, that per was perpetuated that a lot of steel workers died. Not a single active steel worker died because of the smog. Everybody who was working at the mill survived. They may have gotten sick, but they may, may survive. Now, the, mill, the, the zinc works is going to go out of business in 1957, and it's not because of the smog disaster. It's because of this. The Imperial Smelting Company of Avonmouth, England, is going to come up with a new way to smelt zinc. The Belgian process is going to be put out of business. And so uh, everybody says that the zinc works shut down because of the smog. No, the zinc works shut down because of good old fashioned capitalist competition. Somebody else came up with a better way of doing it. American Steel and Wire or United States Steel was not going to try to compete with this. And so they just phased out the zinc process and let the, the, the Nora Mill shut down. And they stood there for a while. I mean, these are color photographs after the mill was actually closed. The railroad yards were still running through uh, the, the zinc works. Uh, the wire works and the blast furnace were still going in the open heart at, 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 at the time. But this is, this, this is, these are the last vestiges. And the color photographs from the late 1950s, early 1960s of the North zinc works. And you can see the effect on Webster Hill there. And then eventually demolishing the the, the, the zinc works and to the point of 1966 was the last year that the mill was actually open. Um, this is Mayor um, Del Sandro, uh, Mayor Albert Del Sandro. Uh, his nickname was Shorty, Shorty Del Sandro. And he was asked in 1966 um, why Denora doesn't commemorate in any way uh, the, the 1948 smog disaster. He said, well, we, it's something that we don't like to think about, but the world won't let us forget. And this is what Denora looks like today. Uh, the, when you could see across, literally across the river, uh, there's not a lot of industry in Denora, some industry, but not much. And there were other smog disasters, but we were the worst, without question, smog disaster in the United States. China's going through a similar thing because they are still using the Belgian method in China because they don't have to worry about any labor costs and they don't seem to worry about any type of um, environmental pollution costs uh, either. And th this is a zinc smelter in uh, just a different type of stack that we have in, in the north. It's basically the same thing. Uh, I don't know how they're getting this green stuff to actually grow there. So it's interesting what they might, uh, think they might be putting in. 
So the first legislation that comes out of this is in 1955, and it's totally voluntary. Then the Kennedy administration in 1963 comes out with some more legislation. But the big legislation is going to come in 1970 with Richard Nixon, and then in, again in 1990 with George Bush, Bush the first. And ironically, two Republican presidents are going to be the biggest champions of, of, of environmental protections. And that's and it is due to Bush the first is why we have uh, the DEP and the EPA have the power that they have today that the current administration is trying desperately to, to, to eliminate the DEP and the EPA. Uh, the first Earth Day was a pit on, in 1970, and this was one of the pins at the first Earth Day. We have it in the museum. And the environmental movement starts and challenges that we have uh, for, for the future of clean air and, 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 and water. Okay, um, I'm going to end it there. We, I have a few more things, but um, if I'm going to get to bed by 9.30, I, I, I got to go. Um, so you guys uh, have been great. If you have questions, that, that's, that's the first thing. Because I will stand here until 2 o'clock in the morning answering questions because I like to answer questions. Oh, we're going to get locked in? That's good. We're safe. Yes, ma'am. So there are houses on all these sites now? There are houses and there's a remediation suit by the owners of these houses and it's underway. I mean, you, you can look in the paper. I know the Post-Gazette doesn't really do hard news anymore. Basically, the, right now, I, I don't know what paper you read, but uh, that used to be my paper of choice. It is no longer my paper of choice uh, because basically the Post-Gazette just takes stories from other papers and, 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 and puts, puts them in. I mean. That's a paper that's basically falling apart uh, and, and is in total chaos and disaster. Uh, and my brother-in-law was actually, used to be one of the editors uh, on the editorial board at, at the Post-Gazette. He's been about eight years now. Right. Second part, how long after the close that um, Almost immediately. Uh, relatively quickly. Uh, some businesses have taken over there, uh, but uh, there are houses uh, that were built on what was the old slag dump. They thought that they would just, you know, put down 10 feet of topsoil and then move on. But, uh, you know, um, and again, I'm not a scientist, but I know that the half-life of the toxins that are in the soil are going to be active for a minimum of 10,000 years. So, you know, it, it, it's, 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 we're, we're, we're not going to see the solution to it, obviously. So are we going to have a highway and see the top off in places across the highway? Those are built on top of a chemical site. Yeah, and, and I'm down sure. up here, you can see where other chemical plants are. It's got a hollow line now, so. Yeah, that stuff doesn't go away. Well, the children's hospital is built out in the street up, up, right across from the chemical plants, too, so. Yes, sir. My dad had two sisters buried at St. Dominic's, and we used to drive down there all the time. But I remember looking at that hill, it was about 1949-50, and it was just bare. Right. I would not build a house over there for anything, but it was just, it was not, it was just like brown, like a brown hill or something. Right. The, across right. the river, it was on 837, it's like I'm looking across there. Right. It, yeah. It, but it I looked mean, terrible. Well, the, the, the slag dump on the other side of the river is still there. In fact, that's where I stood when they dropped the Webster Bridge in the river, uh, when they tore the Webster Bridge down, that's where I stood recording it, because that was the, that was the, one of the best vantage points. And but I remember see that. I, I have going it. down along, I guess it was 837, you looked over there. Right. It looked terrible. Oh, yeah, it, it killed all the vegetation on, on, on I felt like I was off west. the north side of the river as well, yeah, and all of the erosion that took place. Sure, and it, 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 that was all, that all was eventually making its way into the river, and, you know, the whole, the whole valley has been compromised. There's, there's, no, there's no question about that. Or the Mid-Monongahela Valley, I should say. Yes? I was just wondering if the new process that took this out of business is as polluting as this was. No, no. Um, they, they, whenever, whenever Imperial came out with their process, their number one priority was to make it less labor-intensive 
and as an added side bonus, something that they had no intention of actually creating, they created a, a far less polluting process as well, um, uh, which I don't think they were aiming for that. They were trying to get, you know, the big business is looking at land, labor, and capital, and so they're, 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 lo they're looking at, at trying to eliminate that labor cost as much as they can. I'd like to add, if I may. Certainly. Uh, I was two years old. <laughs> Whenever this occurred, uh, living in Smith City, as I said, my dad didn't talk that much about it. But I do know that after the fact, I was told my mother and I stayed in the house the whole time. Dad's office was on the second floor above the historical center and smog museum now, mm -hmm. where the switchboard, I believe, was. And the switchboard was there too. It was there too. But my grandfather was foreman of the carpentry uh, the mill, and they, they can't do anything wrong. He pays the bills. Right. You know, my dad's making sales to mill workers. Pays the bills, so you can stay for it. That's what Harry Loftus, I don't know if you knew Mr. Loftus or not, um, he said that's the, that's the deal with the devil that they made. Um, you're going to pay us, it's, you know, we're going to have food on the table, we're going to have a roof over our head, um, and you're going to pay us well, and we're going to send our kids to college, uh, and we're not going to say anything bad about what you're doing to the environment or even to us. So, yeah, that's the deal they made. Yes, ma'am. Is it, is it still all brown? I mean, it's no, it's all come back. I think I showed you that. Uh, oh, I mean, there's, there's, there's the hillside now. And in fact, well, and this was taken in about. I'm going to say I took this about 1990 or so. I mean, I took it a long time ago. Uh, so long ago, I had hair. So. But if the you know if you're saying all of these things are still in, in the ground and everything, why what happens if the vegetation was able to come back? Is it just not as harmful to vegetation as it is to people? It's the active mill that's killing the vegetation. Um, you have to remember that a, a, a tree's roots only go down so far, and then they start to spread out. So once you get 12 or 8, 16 inches down uh, and you cover it, well, they, can, they would come in and cover up like down to 24 inches or something like that. Now they weren't doing that on the rest of the hill, but they were doing it on, the, on, on our side of the river. Um, so vegetation is going to come back. Uh, I mean, when you go out, do you, do you have a garden? And you pull your tomato plants out? How, which way do, do the roots go? Do they go down or do they go out? They, they, they go out. So they're not going down, they're not digging down. You have to, when, it, when, when, when we test the soil, we go, they go, you go down and take a sample from 36 to 48 inches deep, and then you bring that up, and that's what you're testing. You're not just reaching down and scooping up, you know, with your sand, your, your sand shovel that you take to the beach to make a sand castle with. You, you, you're, you're going down 48 inches. Yes. Yes, sir. Back in the mid to uh, late 60s, I, I worked on uh, U.S. Steel uh, galvanizing lines. And at that time, they were coming in with the new regulations when we were building them. Mm -hmm. But still, I'd be in some of them places two, three, maybe four hours. And I used to think, how are these guys working in here eight hours a day? Be between yeah, the smells and the heat, it was unbelievable. Oh yeah, and that's and it, why... Like you say, for them it was a job. It put us, put us in the house and food on the tables. And they, they wouldn't say nothing because they had nothing else to do. Right, a lot of those guys actually had two jobs. Um, that was, the zinc works was their primary job. That was the one that was paying them the most and giving them the best benefits. And then they were going out and getting a job at Montgomery Wards or somewhere else. And they, and, I mean, these guys were making really nice money at the time, which was great because you know what they did is that they had a lot of disposable income, and then they would get and buy these eight millimeter cameras, and, that, and we have boxes and boxes of film, and, and I've sat through a lot of it. A lot, a lot of it is, yeah, somebody's first Holy Communion, a birthday party, a picnic, but then all of a sudden you see them, they're in the mill with these, and it's incredible. I mean, this is something that would never be allowed today in, in any business. But these guys would take these eight millimeter cameras in the mill, and so we have we, we have footage of people working in the mill um, that I'm sure United States Steel lawyers would not be happy with. 
Yes, sir. That one picture you showed up, the guy was opening all these doors and stood up. Uh, oh, right. It, it, they don't smell zinc like they do steel, but I mean, yeah. Uh, zinc is an interesting process. How do they do that? How does that work that all the doors are open? Uh, yeah, uh, well, th those were th those were uh, each individual furnaces. All, all of those little spelters, you remember, you, see, you saw all those dots? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are individual spelters that have the zinc process coming in. Now, zinc is, is, is the one metal that is worked, uh, it starts off as a solid, it goes to a liquid, it goes to a gas, comes back to a liquid, and then eventually becomes a solid again, taking all of the impurities out of it. Mostly they're trying to take the sulfur out of it. That's why, and there's also acid in it that they're taking out. So that's why there's an acid plant. Uh, these byproducts are things that they're selling. They're selling those off as well. Um, so that was a big part of American Steel and Wire in Denora was the zinc works. There were 8,000 jobs down at that whole Denora works complex. Almost 5,000 of those jobs were in the zinc works because that was the most labor intensive part of the whole operation. So whenever the zinc works closed, it wasn't as though one department out of four closed. It was it, over half of the workforce was put out of work. So that's why it was so much more devastating. It would have been better if the blast furnace had closed or the open hearth had closed because fewer guys would have been put out of work. Okay. Uh, come visit us at the Denora Historical Society. We are, I'm proud to say, open every Saturday from, <laughs> from 10 o'clock until 3 o'clock. Uh, so come and visit us. Uh, we help students from all over. Uh, currently, I'm working with a PhD candidate from Drexel and a PhD candidate from Brown, as well as the local brownies who are we're working on a uh, recycling project. So uh, we, we can help, no matter where you are in the academic spectrum, we can cover you. Thank you.